Hello everybody. In this short lesson, we will be looking at Coulomb's law and uh, we will zoom in at the discrete charge distribution. In other words, we will study how individual charges interact with other charges. Our agenda today is pretty short and simple. We will look at the concept of fields as well as we will look at what really are electric charges. If we are to study how charges interact, we should be able to define what a charge is and uh, state exactly the properties of electric charges. Now we will look at discrete charge distributions. In other words, we will calculate the force experienced by one charge in the presence of many charges. And in so doing, we will employ the principle of superposition of charges. This really is an important principle in physics. You see it in waves. You saw it in gravitations. You're going to see it now in electrostatics as well as you will see it in magnetism and so on and so forth. So it will repeat itself over and over as long as you will be dealing with vector quantities. The concept of fields. Suppose a boy pushes a box across the floor. The boy interacts with the box thereby exerting a force on the box that causes the box to move forward. The force the boy exerts on the box is called the normal force and it's an example of a contact force. Physically, it makes sense because we can see the boy pushing the box. Therefore, it's logical that you can conclude that the box is moving forward because the boy is pushing the box. He exerts a force on the box that causes the box to move forward. But on the other hand, if you look at this scenario, you see a magnet attracting ion filings into itself. The mystery is the magnet and the ion filings are not in contact with each other, but the magnet is capable of exerting a force across space without direct contact on the ion filings. So the question is, how is that possible? How can an object without in, not in physical contact with another object exerts a force on that object? This type of forces are called non-contact forces, also known as action at a distance force. You see, electrostatics, magnetism, gravitation, these concepts are all related to non-contact forces. But how can we explain the mechanism through which they act? In order for us to be able to explain how this happens, we need to look at things differently. So how do we explain why objects are capable of exerting a force on another object not in contact with itself. This is a pen. If I allow the pen, it falls. It falls because something is pulling the pen from below. But really, there is nothing between the earth and the pen, but yet it is capable of attracting the pen and pulling it downwards. So how do we explain how gravity works? How do we explain how magnetism works? How do we explain how electric forces works? So in this short unit, we will look at how objects interact with other objects at a distance we will be able to explain how and why an object can ex exert a force on another object at a distance, as well as we will talk about what fields really mean and how we could represent fields. More specifically, we will define what electric fields are, what creates them and how and what they do affect. There are two types of fields vector fields 
and scalar fields. A scalar is a physical quantity that has only a magnitude with no direction associated to it. For example, if I say that the temperature of this room is 50 degrees Celsius, it is a number and a unit, it doesn't have a direction associated to it. Pressure is another example of a scalar quantity. Area is another example of a scalar quantity. Now, a scalar field generally is defined as a function that gives a numerical value to a physical quantity at every point in space. Let me put it again. A scalar field generally is a function that gives a numerical value to a scalar quantity at every point in space. Let me give you a good example. The map that you see, this is the temperature map of the United States by the Weather Channel taken at about October 2016. If you look at the map, the numbers that you see across the screen represent the temperature at different localities across the United States. This map is a temperature scalar field. If you look in closely, you will be able to see a pattern. You will be able to connect different points that are at the same temperature. This map is an example of a scalar field. It is just a map that shows you the temperature value at a particular location. How do we represent a scalar field? Scalar fields naturally are represented using contour maps. A contour is a line that connects points with the same numerical value. So if you look at the map on the screen, you will see lines. These contour lines actually connect points with the same value. This is 45 degrees. It connects another point with 45 degrees, which connects another point with 45 degrees. So this is a contour line that connects points with the same numerical value. If you pick another point, this line connects points that has a temperature of about 60 degrees. And this goes on and forth. So scalar fields are represented by contour maps. Now you will see this later on in the semester when we will talk about electric potentials. And, and, and we will draw equipotential lines, which more or less are contour lines that connect points at the same potential. But it's important you understand that a scalar is a physical quantity that has only a magnitude and a unit associated to it. Now, a scalar field is a function, sometimes or a mathematical function, that assigns a numerical value to a scalar physical quantity at every point in space. Typical examples of scalar fields include temperature scalar fields, you have altitude scalar fields, you have pressure scalar fields, you have humidity scalar fields. These are all functions that gives a particular numerical value for a given physical quantity at every point in space. On the other hand, to represent a scalar field, we use contour lines, a line that connects different locations, different points with the same numerical value. Another type of fields that we are very much interested in are vector fields. A vector is a quantity that has 
a magnitude, a direction, and a unit associated to it. Unlike a scalar that is that has only a magnitude and a unit, a scalar physical quantity has a magnitude, a direction associated with that quantity, and a unit that can be used to identify that physical quantity. Examples of vector quantities include force, you have velocity, you have acceleration, you have electric fields, and so on and so forth. If you look at the diagram on the screen, this is a jet stream. This diagram shows the wind direction across the United States taken in September 2016. What you can clearly see is that the jet streams are represented by arrows. The arrows right here indicates the direction of the jet stream and the, the, the length of the line indicates the magnitude or the, the speed of the jet streams. Now, it is important for you to understand that a vector quantity generally is represented by an arrow in which the direction of the arrow represents the direction of the field at that given point and the length of the arrow is proportional to the magnitude of that given vector quantity. How do we represent a vector field? There are two ways by which we can represent a vector field. We can use short arrows to represent the direction of the field at any given point in space. Let me say that again. We can use short arrows to represent the direction of the field at any given point in space. Now, the direction of the arrow at that given point represents the direction of the vector at that particular point. The length of the arrow is proportional to the magnitude of the vector at that given point. Let me give you an example. If you look at the positive charge, you could see that the electric field around the positive charge is represented by short arrows. Now, the arrows are pointing away from the positive charge, meaning that the electric field lines around the positive charge You could clearly see that the arrows are pointing away from the positive charge, which is a clear indication that ele the electric field around the positive charge points away. On the other hand, if you have a negative charge, the field lines point towards the negative charge which is totally opposite to the direction in which the fuel lines are pointing on a positive charge. So if you put a positive charge and a, a negative charge, you will clearly see that the fuel lines point from the positive charge to the negative charge and you could clearly see the magnitude and direction of the field at every given point in space. Isn't this a beautiful diagram? So this is the electric field around a positive charge pointing away. This is the electric field 
around a negative charge you could see the direction of the arrows pointing into the charge and this is the electric field that surrounds a positive and a, a negative charge now another way that we could actually represent electric fields is what we call field line representation now this is actually the oldest way that electric fields have always been represented now my personal preference is the first method whereby the field at the particular point is represented by a short arrow whose magnitude is proportional to the size of the field at that given point and whose direction gives me the direction of the field at that point. Now a vector field line essentially is a line of force drawn in such a way that the field line at that given point is tangent to the field at that point. Now, it is important to note that vector field lines never cross each other. If they do cross each other, it implies that the field has two directions at that given point in space, which is not possible. If you look at the diagram shown on the screen, this is a positive charge. This is another positive charge. You could see electric field lines pointing away from the positive charge. You know that one positive charge will repel another and electric field lines cannot cross each other. So they kind of repel each other of this way. So this is the electric field line representation of electric fields. On the other hand, if you look at the electric field between a positive and a negative charge, you see that the field lines leave a positive charge and actually terminate on a negative charge and they kind of repel each other and so they bulge out. But one of the peculiar things that you need to note is that they do not cross each other. So the question remains, what generate electric fields? Now, there are essentially three types of electric fields. Sorry, there are essentially three types of vector fields that you will encounter in this course. Probably you have seen gravitational fields. We will talk about electric fields. We will talk about magnetic fields. Electric and magnetic fields are sometimes combined to call electromagnetic fields. Gravitational fields are generated by any object that has mass. Electric fields are generated by electric charges and magnetic fields are generated by moving charges. In other words, naturally an electric charge surrounds itself with an electric field. That is an intrinsic property of an electric charge. In other words, every charge is born with an electric field. Just like every mass has a gravitational field. If the charge moves or is in motion, it generates a magnetic field. In other words, magnetism is due to electricity. There are two types of charges. You have positive charges and you have negative charges. If you look at this positive charge, the field lines emanate from the positive charge 
and terminate on a negative charge. But where do these charges come from anyway? You see, matter, you and I, the book you're probably holding right now, the pen I am holding, the decks I am sitting on, the computer that we work on, the camera taking the video of me right now, are all composed of atoms. These atoms has three essential properties. Every atom has a nucleus that consists of protons and uh, neutrons as well as electrons. The only atom that doesn't have a neutron is a hydrogen atom. But generally, every atom has a proton, a neutron, and an electron. Now, protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and neutrons are neutral. Now, when you look at the structure of an atom, you could see that protons are found in the nucleus, and electrons orbit the nucleus in what we call shells. The most important thing that you need to take note is that protons and neutrons are kind of locked up. Protons and neutrons are kind of bound, that is a better word, in the nucleus by a very strong force. Meaning that protons and neutrons in under natural circumstances cannot leave the nucleus. So an atom therefore can only lose or gain electrons under natural circumstances. In, this will really become important later on in the chapter when we will be talking about charge transfer. In other words, charges can be transferred from one object to another by the movement of electrons. It's important you keep that in mind. Electric charges are conserved. In other words, we cannot create or destroy an electric charge. They can only be transferred from one object to another. The process of transferring charges is what we call electrocution. Now, if charges can neither be created nor destroyed, it means that the net amount of charge in an isolated system will remain constant. This is an important principle that will manifest itself later on in the chapter in what we call Kikov's laws. Now, another interesting property of charges is that charges are quantized. Quantization is a word that is commonly used to mean fixed amounts. The smallest unit of an electric charge that can occur in nature freely is the charge on a proton or the charge on an electron. Let me say that again. The smallest amount of charge that can exist freely in nature is the charge on a proton or the charge on an electron. This is known as the elementary charge. 
This means that any amount of charge in an object is a multiple integral of the amount of charge on a proton. In other words, the total charge on an object, Q, will be equal to NE. where Q represents the amount of charge in an object and basically is an integer that begins with 1, 2, 3 and so on and so forth and E is the charge on a proton which is equivalent to 1.6 times 10 to the 19 Coulombs. Charges can be transferred easily in conductors. Insulators are objects of material that cannot easily transfer charges under normal circumstances. For example, rubber is an insulator, wood is an insulator. They really could not transfer charges easily under normal circumstances. Now, semiconductors can behave like conductors or insulators depending upon its temperature. Now, that is a special case that we are going to talk about later on in the semester, but there are materials can be categorized into three groups. You have conductors, which can transfer charges easily. You have insulators, which do not easily transfer charges under normal circumstances as well as semiconductors which can behave either as a conductor or a semi sorry or an insulator depending upon the environmental conditions more specifically depending upon its temperature so if you look at here this is a, a charge object this is a neutral object if we place a metal across the charge and the neutral objects charges will flow from or electrons will flow from the neutral object to the charged object meaning that the charges will redistribute itself this can only be possible because the metal is a conductor of charges or electricity on the other hand if you look take wood and you place across these two balls, you will see that this object remains neutral while these objects remain charged. And the reason is because wood cannot transfer charges since it is an insulator. Now, how really can we charge an object? Charging, there are essentially three ways by which we can actually charge an object. We can charge an object by friction or rubbing. We can charge an object by transfer or touching. We can charge an object by the process of electrostatic induction electrostatic induction it is important you note this because you will also encounter electromagnetic induction which is something totally different Charging by transfer or contact or touching occurs when you bring an object that is already charged and touch it or place it in contact with an object that is not charged. Now the charges in the charged object will be shared with the uncharged object. So the uncharged object now becomes charged simply by touching or by contact. Charging by electrostatic induction. Now what this it, it follows a series of steps. 
this is a neutral rod meaning that the total amount of positive charges and the total amount of negative charges are equal so if you positive 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 negative 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 so if the total amount of charge on there is not zero but the total amount of positive charges balances the total number of negative charges making the rod neutral so a neutral object is an object that has equal number of positive charges an equal num equal number of positive charges and negative charges it does not mean that the object is does not have charge at all you need to be you need to be very careful with with the phrasing of some of the questions you will encounter now if you bring a positive charge object towards this neutral object what happens is that electrons will be attracted towards the positive charges we know that a positive charge will attract a negative charge a positive charge will repel another positive charge a negative charge will repel another negative charge as a matter of fact like charges attract and unlike charges repel so if we bring a positively charged rod what happens is that it will attract electrons towards itself and repel all the positive charges to the opposite ends of the rod you will clearly see here that the charges are separated this separation of charges is what we call polarization if you notice even though this object is polarized it is not charged because the total number of negative charges is equal to the total number of positive charges charging by friction if you take this balloon and you rub it off the sweater what happens is that electrons will be attracted from the sweater to the balloon making the balloon negatively charged and the sweater positively charged this explains why the balloon is now attracted to the sweater it is now negatively charged being attracted by a positively charged object now the balloon has acquired charges through the process of rubbing or friction so when you rub two things two or more objects together there is a high possibility that one of the objects will become charged now take note because of polarization neutral objects will always be attracted by charged objects let me say that again because of polarization neutral objects will always be attracted by charged objects take for example you have here a charged object and this is a neutral object it has equal number of positive and negative charges but because this charge object is placed very close to but not touching the neutral object something remarkable will happen it will attract electron towards itself this end will become negative and it will repel electrons away from itself so this object is now polarized 
birth because these charges are very close to this object what happens it will be attracted so polarization basically ensures that neutral objects will be attracted to both charged objects. So you see that the balloon, when you take the balloon closer to the wall, what happens? It repels electrons away from itself, leaving the outer end of the wall with more protons. As a result, this process right here is what we call polarization polarization now the balloon is now attracted to the wall if the wall could move it will be attracted to the balloon you see that these positive charges are now being attracted by these negative charges causing the balloon to stick onto the wall electric forces now, surrounding every charged particle is an electric field. Now, this means that if you place a charged particle around another charged particle, it will experience a force. The force experienced by one charged particle on another depends on a couple of factors. It is repulsive if the charges are of the same sign and attractive if the charges are of opposite sign. As a matter of fact, like charges attract and unlike charges repel. Like charges attract and unlike charges repel.